Uh, so we're here today with Dr. Gretchen Goldman, who is with the Union of Concerned Scientists and did her PhD at Georgia Tech, uh, working in environmental engineering and looking at air quality and some of the public health effects. Um, I'll let her talk more about her research as that's necessary. And uh, she's kindly agreed to give us an introductory lecture on history of air pollution, kind of general background. So as we move into looking at social entrepreneurial solutions or for RIT kind of other maybe approaches to the wicked problem. And um, we have something to go off of and she'll also be um, providing, able, able to answer some questions as we go through the rest of the semester. Um, so with that, uh, Dr. Goldman, it's over to you and things are recording and we will do questions uh, as they come up. I can type some of them in and we can also do questions at the end. Okay. Okay, great. Um, that sounds good. Just um, if you have questions while I'm talking, um, try to talk loud. It's a uh, you're a little a little quiet, so I want to make sure I hear them. If I'm, I'll, if I'll probably actually I'm type them into the side here. Um, they'll they'll show up in the chat box. Okay. Oh, so I'll be able to see them. Yeah, you won't need we won't need to worry about hearing, and we'll just type them. So. Uh, okay, great. Um, yeah, so that sounds good. Feel free to interrupt me if um, anything needs clarification. I'll try to talk for about 30 minutes so we can leave time at the end for questions as well. Um, or if you're, if you're not watching this live, we can um, also, I'm told, answer questions on the online forum as well. Um, so um, as Alex said, I, I did my PhD at Georgia Tech doing air quality and public health and uh, looking at uh, the zone between air pollution and health effects there, and and I've um, since been able to um, transition into doing science policy work, and so I've it's given me a a good um, angle on being able to understand the, both the science and um, you know how policy changes happen with regard to air pollution. So um, I think uh, my presentation will be a combination, and hopefully you'll be able to see sort of. Uh, the different levers, I would say, that um, you know cause air pollution in the first place, and then um, the levers that help us be able to address them. So let's get started. So I wanted to start with this photo. This is one of my one of my favorite photos. And um, first, I just want you to look and and see all the different elements of the photos. How many people are there? Um, how they're moving around using a lot of different uh, forms of transportation. Um, and I want if you get nothing else out of this presentation, um, I just want you to remember that air pollution is a function of the choices that we make. Um, and so it's not something this is automatic. This is uh, all a function of our choices. And so where did it all start? So uh, some of the earliest instances of air pollution were from, um, we hear from accounts of ancient Rome. And uh, we knew this at first through a lot of different writings um, and, and what people described when they went through Rome and um, at the height of the empire. And uh, this is from the Roman philosopher Seneca. And he said, as soon as I had gotten out of the heavy air of Rome and from the stink of the smoky chimneys thereof, being stirred, poured forth toward pestilent vapors and soot they had enclosed in me, I felt an alternation of my disposition. So, um, so we see this as pretty vivid. It sounded like it was pretty um, uh, intense air pollution even for back in those days. And, um, and aside from just writings, eventually we also um, were able to use scientific study to confirm that there was air pollution um, back in Roman times. And uh, there was a paper that came out that looked at ice cores, and it found that um, they could detect from lead smelting that was happening in ancient Rome that they um, it actually had enough pollution that was on par with the Industrial Revolution, which of course came way later and had a lot more industry. So. Um, so this shows it actually was a, a decent amount of air pollution even back in those days. And, um, but even then, we, we see that there was not a lot of action to address air pollution then. And you know, we went a long time before there was any sort of uh, policy or, or any sort of actions taking place to, to really address air pollution. And, and so why was this? Um, this is, um, first, we, this is how that they, um, they first started to note that emissions, so what we emit into the air, um, would have an effect on 
atmospheric concentrations. Um, so we knew that way back in Rome and um, you know probably earlier, um, but we didn't necessarily do anything about it at that point. And this is largely because the, the solution to pollution is dilution, which I'm sure you've heard. Um, and I think we could get away with, with this mantra for a long time because of that and um, with populations being lower, air pollution probably um, didn't stick around very long when even on, on worse days. And, um, and so we were able to sort of ignore the, the problem for um, the most part for many years. Um, but eventually we couldn't follow this strategy forever and that was because in addition to, um, to uh, this cliche, it's also this and um, that air pollution is also the tragedy of the commons. So um, we start to see as populations increase and industry increases that um, it's not a problem that we can ignore. And we started to really see this in the Industrial Revolution. Um, and during this time, we, uh, we really learned how to harness uh, fossil fuels, um, largely coal at the time. We learned to extract minerals. And, um, and this gave us a lot of uh, improvements in quality of life, of course. Um, but we learned to do this at a massive scale. And what this led to is um, air, pol air pollution problems, particularly with smoke and ash, uh, from the burning of coal and oil um, in boilers, furnaces, uh, locomotives, and marine vessels, um, but also in home heating, fireplaces, and furnaces. Um, and so where did, this, uh, where did this eventually lead us? Um, so now I want to go back to my favorite photo. And here, um, you know, we see this is, so this photo is, it's downtown Atlanta in 1913. And you can see from this photo, we see a lot of the new technologies that we got out of the Industrial Revolution. Um, we see, all, we see a, a streetcar and the tracks there, and, um, and there's also a, a gasoline vehicle, an early one on the side there. Um, but we also see a lot of horses, a lot of pedestrians, there's a, a bicycle, I think. And um, so, so we see we had a lot of, um, a lot of different things happening. And so if you look at this and you compare this to, say, a, a major downtown in any a uh, large U.S. city today, and I think it's, um, it becomes very clear what, what the difference is here. Um, and so we had all these different modes at this time, but what did we choose? Um, I, think, uh, I think we can all agree that for the most part, gasoline vehicles won. And so um, the next step that we, we took was we destroyed a lot of the streetcar tracks um, that we had and a lot of the other diversifying um, effects that, that allowed us to have different modes of transportation. And, um, and we, we chose with our wallets and with our policies and, and our planning um, to focus on the automobile. Um, and so this is just a few short years, short years later and uh, we see that, that cars are really becoming the dominant vehicle on the road. And so this started to have um, consequences for us, which we'll, which we'll see, the fact that we, we chose this to be our, our primary mode. Um, and so a few years after that, um, one of the first major air pollution episodes um, occurred. And this was in Denora, Pennsylvania. And uh, the residents of Denora woke up on October 27th in 1948, and they, there was a heavy smog over the town. And um, this wasn't especially unusual. The town um, often had smog in the mornings. There was a lot of industry um, in the town, particularly there was a zinc plant um, that was local. And so they didn't um, you know, think anything of it initially, but the smog didn't go away, and it stayed all day. And it um, eventually led to residents feeling burning sensations and um, being really irritated by this by this smog and eventually what they did was they asked that, that zinc plant that was local to, to shut down at least until the episode cleared um, but they, the plant refused and so um, the residents were, were stuck in this smog that they later determined to be filled with metals, SO2, um, carbon monoxide and, and other pollutants and all told, this, um, this led to half of the 14,000 res residents to experience severe respiratory or cardiovascular problems, and it ultimately resulted in about 40 deaths. And so what was the cause of this, and you know, why did it happen that time? Um, so like I said, there was a lot of 
industrial emissions that were regularly present in the town. Um, but we also had a meteorological situation that, that led to this particular episode. We had uh, warm air aloft that served to, to trap this cooler, denser air below that. Um, and that's a, a good recipe to have bad air pollution problems. Um, and so this was largely the first time that we were really able to observe that air pollution kills. Um, and so some people actually consider this one event in Donora to be uh, the beginning of the environmental movement because it really showed that recognition that, that pollution could have deadly consequences. And a few years after that, um, we saw an even larger um, public health crisis from air pollution. And this was uh, the Great Smog, which happened in, in London in 1952. Um, here we saw air pollution levels that were five times higher than normal. Um, here it was largely particulate matter and sulfur dioxide as the, the pollutants of concern. Um, and it was the same situation. We saw a smog that just didn't leave and um, here it ultimately resulted in um, almost 4,000 deaths, they think, and um, much of those deaths were, were due to cardiorespiratory diseases. Um, and so why did these particular episodes, you know, what made them so bad? Um, so the recipe for having these, these severe pollution episodes is first we need pollutant emissions. Um, here these were both sort of industrial sources. Um, in London though it's also a lot of, a lot of chimneys, so uh, um, burning of uh, fuels for heat. Um, so that was present in the air. And if you combine that with poor meteorological conditions, and um, in this case, this is a lot of times it comes from inversion layers, and this is where um, you get air that gets trapped sitting over a city, and um, normal meteorological patterns, of course, allows the air to move through. There's wind and other sort of circulations that um, allow the air pollution to be diluted. Um, but if you get a situation where there's an inversion, what we get is um, all of those emissions that come out from the ground end up just sitting in that air. And um, this is when we get some really bad um, episodes. And so uh, these two um, severe air pollution episodes um, allowed us to make an additional connection. So not just that our emissions lead to high concentrations in the ambient air, um, but also that that leads to some biological response, that we're actually seeing um, public health uh, concerns come out of the fact that, that we're polluting. Um, and so this is what really drove us to, um, to do something and take action about, about air pollution. Um, and so next up, we, we passed some early air pollution laws in the United States, starting with, in 1955, the Air Pollution Control Act. And this was followed in, in 1963 and 67 by two more pieces of legislation. And what these, what these early laws really did was, was they uh, authorized and provided funding for research into air pollution. Um, we did emissions inventories. So first looking at, well, what are we actually emitting? Um, what's actually causing the problem? Um, it also funded a lot of research on monitoring and control. Um, at this early stage, it wasn't even you know, clear how, what's the best way to measure these air pollutants in a way that um, we can really detect what, what the problem is. Um, and it also sort of set the groundwork for looking at enforcement and if we were going to control, how would we do it? How would we hold um, actors to, to better air quality and, and lower emissions? And um, so these were the, these three laws set the, the early stages of air pollution control in the U.S. and um, thinking about what we do about this problem. Um, and so that culminated eventually with um, the Clean Air Act amendments of 1970. This is uh, President Nixon signing those amendments. Um, and these were really important amendments. This was really um, the, that really set the stage for all future legislation, and including the current legislation on air pollution. And, and really importantly, the amendments of 1970 also furthered research into the, the science behind air pollution and a lot of its, its, a lot of its impacts. And so um, at this stage, this is what we knew. We knew there were atmospheric concentrations and those were having health effects, um, but with sort of the funding and the backing of um, policy to help us do the research that we needed to, to fill out all the steps, we were able to, to really figure out the whole process. So um, from the atmospheric concentrations, we could look at what, what's the actual exposure that people are, are getting. So um, if we were to put a monitor right at someone's mouth, what would they be breathing? And so um, that's different than atmospheric concentrations. And so, um, 
exposure really depends on where people are. Are they outside? Are they inside? Are they next to sources or are they um, further away from them? And so um, we can start to look more at, at the exposure and what people are actually breathing. Um, and we can start to look further at um, what gets into the lungs, what gets into um, people, and how much how much of the pollution are they getting. And so um, this takes into account other other factors like breathing rate and um, how big people's lungs are in general. Ch children and um, adults will breathe breathe in different levels of air pollution, and so um, there was also a need to do research into that and what people would actually be breathing. Um, and then next, we we want to look at the toxicity. So, what is um, what is the actual um, response, and what's what's the mechanism that's causing the health outcome? And so, um, there's a lot of work that goes into thinking about how we see the biological response. So, what if um, if air pollution seems to be causing heart attacks? Then we can look at um, what's the actual mechanism that's causing that. So, what about that pollutant really makes it um, toxic to people? And so. Um, this opened the door to researching all these different areas and, and really getting a full understanding of the, the etymology and the, the reason behind air pollution and how it relates to public health. And so um, with the backing of, of science and really having a better understanding of, of the mechanisms that cause um, public health impacts from air pollution, um, we were able to revise our laws and improve them and, and tighten them to really uh, be aligned with this new science. And so um, we saw some more amendments in 1977 um, and the most recent amendments which happened in 1990. And so I want to uh, spend some time talking about the, the amendments of 1990 because this is um, uh, largely how air pollution is regulated in the U.S. today and um, it's considered by many to be one of the most significant pieces of environmental legislation that's ever been enacted. Um, and so one of the, the keystones of this law, um, and I'm um, sorry, I'm getting a question. Um, yeah, we maybe are overdue for another stat. I think um, uh, there's some mechanisms, and you'll see there's, there's ways that they do, um, we do sort of update them or, or adjust them based on things, but um, I think that certainly uh, warrants discussion that, uh, that it is possible that we um, need to update the act as well. Um, so one of the flagship provisions of the, the amendments is the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or the NACs, and um, this is largely what, you, what you'll hear the most about, and I'm going to spend um, a little more time going into what those are later. Um, but this is regulating pollutants in the ambient air, so measuring what, what's actually in the air, no matter where it comes from, um, and trying to make sure that the air outside that we breathe is, is clean. And so. Um, that's one part of the act. And there's also um, a section that focuses specifically on mobile sources. Um, so this is looking just at cars and trucks and regulating the emissions um, out of those. And um, this is a good idea given um, that we chose the gasoline automobile as our main, um, our main mobility source in most cities. And so this, um, there's still a, a huge um, source of air pollution in um, in the U.S., I think it depends on the pollutant, but um, cars and trucks are responsible for 90% of the carbon monoxide pollution that we have and um, a, a good chunk of the ozone and the particulate matter pollution um, that we see today as well. And it also has a new source performance standard. So these are um, looking at stationary sources, so uh, things that, that emit pollution um, from a building. So um, power plants, manufacturing facilities, and things like that. Um, and that, emits, that regulates what comes out of them, and they have, um, they have to use certain technologies to be able to operate. They have to obtain permits, and so um, this regulates a lot of um, any new source that comes online, and um, they're regulated differently if they are in a place that already has bad air versus a, a place that doesn't. Um, and another important uh, piece to pull from this part is that it's only applying to uh, new sources. And so um, there's concern and there's been a lot of um, criticism about whether or not the sources, um, there should also be a, a rule that uh, more directly 
addresses emissions from existing plants. And um, th there has been some recent action to try to also uh, regulate those better as well. And there's also uh, emission standards for HAPs, or hazardous air pollutants. Um, and so this is also a, a, a clause that was added because of the science. So um, in the original Clean Air Act, there wasn't a provision for this. And um, what the science started to show us was that in addition to um, the pollutants that the EPA was regulating, um, there was also these, these other pollutants that weren't being regulated as directly, um, but they were still causing uh, health impacts, um, particularly these um, hazardous air pollutants, or they're sometimes called air toxics as well. Um, these include a lot of carcinogens, and um, it was found that they were resulting in uh, a thousand to three thousand deaths per year. Um, and so they recognize there was this need to regulate them separately. And so, so currently the the EPA regulates 187 of these hazardous air pollutants. And another part of the act uh, deals with acid deposition. So this is um, dealing with controlling for acid rain, which um, was a, a much bigger problem in, in years past and um, is largely considered to have been a, a one of the more successful provisions as far as um, getting us to a point where it's, it's less of a concern for some of the major um, impacts that we were worried about acid rain uh, for. And so um, there's a provision that keeps that uh, keeps that policy in place. Um, and lastly, there's a section that deals with stratospheric ozone protection. And so um, this is different than ground level ozone, which has um, a different set of concerns that we'll address. But this is particularly um, looking at uh, the ozone layer and um, ozone up high in the air and preserving um, the ozone layer in the air and, and uh, by restricting what we emit at the ground that um, pollutants that have been known to, to cause, um, to disrupt the ozone hole. So I want to focus a little more on the national ambient air quality standards. Um, so these are just the emitting, uh, um, regulating what's in the ambient air. And these um, are really unique standards in that they're uh, science-based. And so the, it's written into the law that um, what the, what the standards have to be set at a level that protects public health. Um, and so this is a really strong standard, and not every environmental standard has this sort of uh, power behind it. And so I think of it as the power of NACS that, um, that it really needs to be based on, on what the science says protects public health. And um, this was actually challenged at one point in a court case um, that made it to the Supreme Court. And, uh, Whitman versus the American Trucking Associations, um, and the the Supreme Court ruled that um, they do have to base it based on public health. And so, um, in setting the standard, um, the administrator of the EPA um, cannot consider implementation costs in NACs, and so they can't consider uh, what the cost of reaching that standard is. It only considers um, the public health in in setting what um, the level of pollution that's acceptable. And so, um, so this is very powerful. Um, and so, if uh, on the NACs, what it does is that it um, it looks at regulating the atmospheric concentrations. Um, and so, what we're really concerned about here is is what those atmospheric concentrations are, um, and what their association is to um, to the biological response. And so, this is uh, largely what my research covered as well, and um, comparing what those ambient con concentrations are um, to what the health effects we are that we see. And it's of course um, really important to know all the intermediate steps so we can know how to um, how to control it and how best to manage it in other in other ways. But um, largely, what we see is um, comparing these these two variables. And the way that we do that is we measure the ambient air. Um, so these are some air pollution monitors and um, that are used to, to set the standard and to set what the concentrations are at each city. Um, so as you can see, they're not um, they're placed to be not right next to a roadway or um, any other sort of air pollution source. And so the idea with that is to um, uh, to make sure that it's capturing the background air. And so we don't want it to be capturing what's direct coming directly out of the tailpipe, but we want it to be capturing what is the, the concentration in the general air for someone living in the city. 
And so I'm going to show you some, some examples of um, how trends have been over time in different air pollution. Um, and we're going to look at Atlanta because that's uh, what I have the data for. But, um, but it'll actually be very characteristic of a lot of major cities will have um, similar trends in air pollution over time. Uh, so these are the six pollutants that uh, the NACS regulates currently. So it's particulate matter, ozone, uh, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and lead. And these are what the, the current standards are, although um, they are always be ongoingly updated. Um, every five years, the EPA is charged with uh, revisiting the standard, revisiting the science, and assessing whether or not that, that standard still makes sense. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually talk about these in, in reverse order to what they are here. Um, but uh, So I'm going to lead with lead. Um, so lead was a problem. Um, yeah, and um, first uh, I, I will get to the difference between um, particulate matter when we get to that, uh, that point. Um, so, so lead was a big problem in, um, many years ago, um, and it was largely a problem because we had leaded gasoline. And um, it was recognized that this was largely the problem um, and what was leading to high, high lead levels in the air. Um, and so this was um, a, a really good ex example of policy-driven technology um, that uh, has served to significantly um, uh, improve public health. And so um, once we realized that the leaded gasoline was the problem, um, which received a lot of, of pushback from people, there was a lot of um, uh, feedback from industry that uh, it wasn't possible to do unleaded gasoline, that it really needed to be there. Um, but nonetheless, we moved forward with, the, with setting the standard and um, in enacting regulation of this, um, and uh, the technology was able to um, address it. And so we were able to find alternatives to unleaded and um, to leaded gasoline, and, um, and that was implemented starting in 1976. Um, and following that, we really saw dramatic improvements in public health. We saw an 80% drop in blood lead levels, among other um, issues. Um, and I wanted to highlight this too because um, the lead issue is actually has a really interesting backstory. Um, we see a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot of pushback from industry and um, this reference I have at the bottom is the, the scientist that um, saw a lot of the, the health impacts and it was sort of, um, he, he wrote something where he talked about the um, the issue of uh, where, it, where it was going and what his struggles were in, in getting that um, those policies passed. Um, and next, this is uh, sulfur dioxide, um, and this is the trend from 1970 to 2006 of uh, sulfur dioxide in Atlanta. And you can see um, it does it, were, it was a lot higher. We saw a lot of um, uh, we sort of a lot of reduction in um, in uh, in SO2 levels, um, and particularly you see a jump in uh, 1994 when we switched to low sulfur coal. Um, so the thing about sulfur dioxide I just wanted to mention is that in contrast to a lot of other pollutants, um, sulfur dioxide comes from uh, point sources. So we see them coming from uh, power plants and, and um, particularly coal-fired power plants, but also other um, other sort of industrial sources. But um, the controls on on SO2 are different because we can pinpoint uh, where they're coming from and um, and control it at the source. And so in some ways, um, sulfur dioxide is a little an easier one to control. And next I wanted to look at nitrogen uh, dioxide and carbon monoxide. Um, and you see these two, um, we're looking again at trends from 1970 on. Um, and we see there here that um, the trends look very similar. This is NO2 and this is CO. And um, we, uh, we see this dramatic decline um, starting in the, around 1980. And so this is, um, this is uh, really remarkable. And the reason that they trend together and the reason we were able to reduce those pollution levels so much um, was the catalytic converter. Um, so this is another good example of, of being able to use technology to really address some of the problems. Um, if you're into chemistry, this is a, it's a, it's a really neat um, technology. It, it, it uh, solves several problems all at once. It gets rid of um, NOx and uh, carbon monoxide and um, some hydrocarbons that also have public health concerns. And it, it does it all simultaneously and uh, gives us oxygen and CO2 and water, which is um, infinitely better. So 
Um, it's really an interesting technology, and it's responsible for a lot of uh, improvements that we've seen from um, uh, car and truck emissions. And so I'll save the, the ones that are the biggest problems for last. Um, this is the trend for ozone in, um, from 1970 on. Um, and you can see this is not as much of an improvement story. We see um, largely um, concentration staying level up until now and, um, and you know, in some cases maybe going up. And, um, and this is true of a lot of uh, different um, Different cities, I think, have ozone problems, and so uh, the reason that we haven't um, improved ozone as much um, is uh, going back to that decision that we made about um, having using cars as our primary transportation. Um, we see ozone as um, it's considered a secondary pollutant, which means it it forms in the atmosphere; it's not emitted directly from sources. Um, and so, what it, what ozone needs to form is that it needs um, nitrogen dioxide or some form of NOx, which is um, nitrogen dioxide or nitrogen oxide. And um, it needs volatile organic compounds, and it needs heat and sunlight. And if you mix all these things together in an environment, what you get is a bad ozone. Um, and so a lot of cities have trouble getting their, their ozone down to, a, to meet the, the standard. And um, that's because it's being emitted by a lot of different things, and um, the chemistry gets complicated, and it's, it's much harder of a pollutant to control. And uh, lastly, we'll go back to particulate matter. And so um, particulate matter is um, tiny particles in the air, as the name would imply. Um, and what this was is, um, this is also a good example of the, the science changing and so the way that we talked about it changed. So um, at first, when we were measuring particulate matter, we measured um, what we called TSP, or total suspended particles. And this was just looking at uh, the mass of the particles that were in the air. Um, and then eventually we, we um, the science told us that what was important were the, the really small particles that were in the air. And so we started measuring PM10, which is uh, particulate matter of less than 10 uh, micrometers. Um, and so you can see that this is a figure from EPA. They show some examples of uh, PM10 is on the order of um, the size of dust, pollen, um, small things like that. And then eventually we, um, did some more studies and we found out that um, another pollutant that might be of greater concern public health wise would be PM 2.5. So looking at um, particulate matter less than two and a half microns. And so um, this is our, our trend line for that. And um, you can see all the, the three different measures that we used over time. Um, and this one, we, we do see that the concentrations are decreasing over time. Um, and so it's, it's much better than it used to be for PM. Um, but the problem with this one is that um, the, more, the more scientific studies we do, we find that there's, there's health effects even at lower and lower levels. And so even though this looks like a success story, it's actually still, um, still having a lot of health effects in the US. Um, and so those last two, the particulate matter and ozone, these are the areas where uh, there's the most places in the U.S. that aren't meeting that standard, and, um, and it's also where we see some of the most significant um, health effects. And I wanted to give you a, a slide to just show you what those health effects are. Um, this is one of the first large studies that looked at mortality and um, air pollution rates. Um, and so what you're looking at is this is the, the rate ratio, which is um, it's a, a measure of the increased risk of death that um, someone experiences uh, given an increase in pollution. And so the x-axis is um, micrograms per meter cubed, so concentration of um, PM 2.5. Um, and so here you see that we have the, we found this really clear association between uh, how much pollution is in the air and increased risk of, um, of death in cities. And so, um, and so what this ultimately led us to, to find out is, um, is just how beneficial the Clean Air Act has been. Um, we've seen that if you account for all these public health benefits, um, the benefits actually outweigh the cost 30 to 1. Um, in total, it's expected to reach $2 trillion, just uh, the benefits of having um, that law in place. And I wanted to note, too, that um, in the U.S. it's sort of um, considered to be a, a, one of the laws that has more teeth. So it has more um, actual consequence if you don't uh, meet the standard. And um, this isn't true of, of many countries in the world, and that's one of the, the um, uh, features of, the, of U.S. air pollution control that's really um, made it been so successful because there are consequences for um, 
places that don't meet the standard, and, and it, it does um, drive uh, changes and improvements much faster than it would. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about challenges in future directions, but I, I know I'm over time, so um, I can run through that quickly, or I can, um, or I can save it and, uh, and answer questions now. I don't know if um, there's a preference one way or the other. All right, we'll run through. I won't be too much longer, I promise. Um, OK, so I want to just give you a sense of kind of where we are um, with this and, and what sort of the current discussions are. Um, so some of the, the research questions that are still um, on a lot of people's minds, and we have a lot of researchers working on, uh, one of them is multi-pollutant mixtures. So um, the Environmental Protection Agency is doing a lot of work on this and looking at, um, well, we might be able to tell what, what the um, health effects associated with individual pollutants are, um, but what happens when you mix them all together? Does that have um, new synergistic effects? Are there, is there reason to believe that, um, you know, having this mixture that we're all breathing, of course, um, if that has different health effects, it makes it, does it worsen health effects? Or, um, or conversely, are there protective effects and, and there's some evidence to suggest that might be true in some cases where um, having another pollutant actually makes it better than if you just had one. And, um, so there's a lot of questions there about, about mixtures. Um, we also always have new sources to worry about. There's, um, we're always looking at, at ultrafine particles. So um, this is PM1, um, a less than particulate matter, less than uh, one micron. And um, there's a lot of uh, nanotechnology questions and whether or not um, those can, can have health impacts if we're breathing nanoparticles in. And, um, so there's a lot of, a lot of that. And, and we're also seeing um, new sources as technology always changes. Um, we always see new things. There's different um, energy sources have different pollutant concentrations. And um, those are some, some current research questions that we keep asking. Um, and another thing that's, that's also new is uh, greenhouse gas regulation. Um, and so the Clean Air Act said it would, it would regulate pollutants that, um, that have a, an impact on public health. Um, and so to a lot of people, this meant um, that they should also um, be regulating uh, climate emissions. And so a bunch of states sued the, sued the EPA to um, force this to happen. And this was in Massachusetts versus the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and then that read, reached the Supreme Court. and. Um, this is in uh, 2007, and the Supreme Court decided that um, the yes, the administrator of the EPA, um, should prescribe standards that apply to um, climate emissions. And so, um, so what this means is that the the EPA was um, compelled to regulate um, greenhouse gas greenhouse gases, and um, they've started to do that in a few ways. But I think we're going to continue to see how that evolves and um, what the different tools are that EPA will use to to do that regulation. And so. Um, I think that's a, a science question, but also a, a policy question and thinking about how we, how we move forward with that. Um, another big area is looking at, at equity issues. And so um, it, within the, even within the U.S., just looking at susceptible populations, are there people that are more, more sensitive to health effects from air pollution? Um, and there's lots of environmental justice questions in terms of where we place sources and who is more exposed to air pollution than other populations. And um, there's been some recent work on that that's um, shown that these are, these are things we should be paying more attention to. Um, and I didn't talk much about uh, pollution, air pollution outside of the US um, because I think you, you all are getting a presentation that is focused more there in the future. But, um, but uh, this is obviously a huge area and a lot of other um, places have uh, different struggles in terms of air pollution and um, a lot more um, a lot worse health outcomes to to deal with, and so um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of work that's being done and it continues to be done, looking at how to control for pollution in other places, and um, you know, in places that are rural or um, you know economically disadvantaged, what's what's the appropriate technology? How do we how do we address air pollution in a, in a way that's um, consistent with what those populations are uh, willing to adapt and um, are able to adapt in terms of cost and in terms of uh, culture. And so um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there to really think about um, how we can address air pollution in other places. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention that um, even though in the US we have the, the Clean Air Act and it, 
it's doing a good job. I, I think so, and I think most people think so. Um, but, but there's just still, it's ongoingly um, challenged and it's ongoingly changing um, because of other forces. And so um, there's a lot of um, issues politically and legally that, that sort of change how it um, how it functions or, or could change how it functions. And um, lately, of course, we've seen a lot of funding limitations with the sequester and um, other issues with that. And so um, this could obviously change how much we're able to, to measure and monitor and um, whether or not we're able to keep all the programs that we do have in place. Um, we also see a lot of uh, political attacks and, and legal challenges that sort of um, that seek to inhibit what the what um, how effective the law can be. Um, these are just a few articles that um, sort of demonstrate how this has happened in recent years. Um, uh, there was the Obama administration was going to tighten the EPA standard or the I mean the, the ozone standard based on uh, based on what the science was saying, um, but he got a lot of pushback from um, other forces to to not increase the standards and so not improve um, air quality. Through the act, and so um, and so he backed off, and he didn't improve the standard. And so, um, even though that's supposed to be a, a science-based standard that we're only looking at, we can um, it, he he didn't do it, and so we were we have not improved that standard despite. Um, yeah, and and so this is this is the question. They are legally um, obligated to follow the science, and that's why um, the. Groups have been able to successfully sue the EPA and, and force them to issue standards. Um, the, there's some um, challenges just on the political side because they can consider um, things in setting the standard has to be science-based, uh, but in implementation they're allowed to um, consider other things like costs and uh, other just economic considerations. And so, um, so a lot of times I think they use they hide behind other. Um, Issues in that regard to, to not avoid setting the standard, but um, it's a good question. I think um, I think we'll time will see if um, if someone wants to jump on that and, and try to legally force them to to reset the standard to the based on what the science says. Um, and we also see um, some action from Congress. Uh, we've seen lately um, there's been some um, demands from Congress to want to look at the data and they want to, um, uh, members of the House of Representatives want to be able to see the data um, that was used to set the standard and so um, they're in a lot of uh, battles with the EPA over um, what's transparent and what isn't and um, that gets into a lot of other issues since uh, a lot of the studies are based on um, public health data which of course is um, protected through confidentiality agreements in many cases because it um, involves people's personal health information. And so um, so there's a lot of uh, legal battles and these are all sort of ongoing debates and uh, this is a lot of what my organization focuses on and trying to um, trying to make the case for why things should, should be based on science and why we um, uh, politics doesn't belong in, in thinking about air pollution rules. Um, and so um, with that, I'll wrap it up. And these are just a few resources that I mentioned during the talk and um, a few others. And I'm happy to take questions or um, any discuss anything further. I had you unmuted. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, one question that I want to ask, which is just something that's always intrigued me, is and it may be in that benefits and cost reference that's sitting there, is uh, how have the costs and benefits been distributed? You know, the people that are paid more money to develop new technology or implement things, have they gotten at least their investment back? Or have those been um, really separate in terms of who's benefited versus who's paid? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the exact um, distribution, but certainly it's not evenly distributed in that a lot of um, the controls that need to happen would be industry um, doing, you know, investing in the technology to be able to do the controls and um, the benefits are more societal, right? It's public health costs, it's insurance costs, it's um, uh, lack of sick days and missed work days and you know overall productivity of the of society so so the benefits are very distributed on the cost i think it you know it largely has depended on what the the issue was and where the technology was because in in some cases the the cost will just get passed on to the consumer and um, if it's something that utilities have to implement for example they can just pass it on to 
um, how consumers be the ones paying for it. Um, other industries, it's more um, the, the the industry itself would have to invest in some of the technology to be able to get it um, to market, and so um, so it, it's certainly uneven. I had a question that was pretty specific to the power plants and the Let's, we want to come up here to ask it, just because we're having Emmanuel come up front. That way he can, you can hear it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I had a question that was pretty specific to the power plants and the new source uh, performance standards. Um, I was wondering, like, what happens when a generator exceeds its expected lifetime or if an existing plant adds another generating unit, like if a gas plant adds another turbine. Do they follow the standards from when they were built? Do they follow the <laughs> new standards or, you know, what you know, I could imagine? Uh, some yeah, that's a good, uh... did you want to add us? No. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's a good thing that you picked up on because that is, um, one of the problems with it, I think, when they originally enacted the the new source performance standards, the idea was that um, all of the the plant, the existing plants um, that were just grandfathered in for being older, and um, you know the industry would um, would say that they were about to go offline anyway. They were old, and you know have ex almost exhausted their useful lifetime. Um, but instead, um, once the rules were enacted. Acted. That was why they didn't um, it originally issue existing um, existing plant standards because of that. It was assumed that they would as soon um, uh, be retired, and then there would be uh, everybody would follow the new source um, review standards. But because um, once the rules were enacted, a lot of what we saw was that um, we were keeping these um, grandfathered in facilities, and so now we have plants that um, you know we thought would come offline 30 years ago, but they're actually still operating because um, a lot of that, like you said, happens where they'll just add a different feature to it or upgrade some part of it, and so it doesn't it doesn't qualify as a new source, um, and so they're not subject to those regulations. Right, we have a lot of those. So, Oh yeah, we have, we have a bunch of big coal plants that are still grandfathered, um, and so they uh, have some of those controls. <laughs> right. Yeah, they just um, they just issued existing power plant standards. Um, I'm not sure the exact uh, where we are in the process if they're if they've been enacted yet in, officially, but I know they I know they were trying to run here. Several of the plants here are going to shut down um, because of those existing plant standards because it would be more expensive to retrofit them than to just take them offline. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which is probably good, right? That means the standards are being effective. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Other questions? OK. Well, um, I'm sure we can come up with other things, and we can ask you some of those on forums and in other other ways. Um, do you have any questions, I guess, for us? It's kind of a random flip in the direction. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd be curious what sort of uh, work you are interested in or what, um, you know, where, where you think this might go as far as um, which parts are more more resonant for your group. want to get something that resonates, something they're interested in working on. We're going to be looking at this next week anyway, so. Oh, okay. I'm particularly interested in uh, distributed generation and like microgrids and the smaller portions of the electric that can be bounded. And a lot of times that can be smaller generating units, so like micro turbines or even macro generators that are used at data centers and other facilities. They tend not to be as uh, strictly regulated mm -hmm. as generators that have larger generating units like the EP7. And then with larger generating units, you can kind of, the, the economics work a little better because you kind of have to consume people at the end. So I'm interested in how smaller generating units can wrap their hair with all these standards and technologies. Gretchen, did you catch that? 
Yeah, so um, distributed technology and really thinking about, um, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a it's an interesting angle. I think um, I think there's a lot that can be done there, and um, it doesn't it doesn't get talked about as much. I feel like as far as um, when people talk about new technologies, but it, it's yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there. It could certainly be implemented a lot of um, places, and it you know it, it, it allows more people to be able to have um, access to power. So I think that's a good way to go. Anyone else interested in anything? Personally, I'm, I'm interested in, this is going to be one of the challenges of the class, is air pollution up till now has been very policy driven um, in terms of our response. And I'm, I'm interested to see what we can come up with that is maybe not quite so policy focused maybe works with policy or, or does something different. Um, and that's going to be, that could be behavioral change things around not driving so much and changing some of those choices or we'll see. But um, the course okay. focused on social entrepreneurship, the idea is, is what can we do to supplement policy or get around policy that may be slow to change, right? Coming back to that idea that the last Clean Air Act amendment was 1990, that they've been making rules since then. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, I, it reminds me of a lot of, there's been a lot of kind of citizen science efforts with air pollution too, because um, now as the technology gets cheaper to have, you can actually, you know, get access to a, um, a quick and dirty air pollution monitor that can really, you can take around with you. We did, um, when I was in grad school, we did a, we did a project where we just strapped a monitor to a bike and then biked around the city to get a sense of what sort of the micro variability of pollutants were around the city and um, you can get a sense of, of really how, um, where things are and there's a lot of citizen groups that have taken to um, collecting measurements um, just outside if they are concerned about a source that's near them they can just take a, take a monitor up to the, up to the fence of the facility and, and then have it analyzed to see if there's anything. Uh, concerning in the sample, so um, yeah, I think I think there's a lot that can be done to sort of not have to wait for the the snail pace of uh, federal policy to to save you. <laughs> Which certainly covers a wider area, but if we can come up with some more local pieces and then replicate them, that's another approach. So. Well, yeah, that yeah. sounds great. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, this is a fantastic overview. Um, it's this is an area that I know I have touched on in bits and pieces in some of my research. Um, I know a lot about fuel additives, for instance, but it's not something I've, I've really gotten the, the overview on in the industry, so this is really great. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much, um, And you're welcome to vanish. Um, I think we're gonna have, we'll have another 15 minutes of class here, so we'll talk about some other things. Um, and we'll be in contact okay. via email and forums and other things, so. Okay, great. great. Well, thanks cool. so much for having me. Yep.